Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God I would lay on your hearts today comes from Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 through chapter 2 verse 7. Let me read. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day when I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels and the seven churches, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So far God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed. It's not every Sunday that we have the opportunity to study the book of Revelation. The word revelation actually comes from the Greek word apocalypse. Most people think of the final destruction of the world when they think of that word apocalypse. It's probably been on more than a few people's lips these past few weeks as we've been dealing with the coronavirus. Yet the word apocalypse really means, it simply means, something revealed, something made fully known, something manifested. And so the book of Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, is a revealing of information, commands and visions given by the resurrected and ascended Jesus Christ to his apostle John on the island of Patmos. The revelation, of course, as we read, begins with this radiant appearance of Jesus. And then he goes on to dictate these seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And each letter is addressed to the church's angel. As you probably know, the word angel simply means messenger. And so when the word angel appears in scripture, it's not always referring to God's heavenly creatures. Sometimes it's referring to his earthly creatures, his earthly messengers. In each of these seven letters, each church's angel is its pastor, the one who brings God's message to God's people. 
And the message to this church in Ephesus that we're studying today is that although they were to be commended for their endurance and their faithfulness, they had abandoned the love that they had at first. Their first love. First love. A lot of different things probably pop into your head when you think about your first love. But if you put aside all those romantic notions and think about first love in a professional or a recreational manner, you might consider what first influenced you in a particular direction. So was it your love of math or numbers or physics that inspired you to become an engineer? Was it your love of children that inspired you to become a teacher? Was it your love of art that inspired you to pick up photography, or perhaps your love of a certain cuisine that inspired you to start cooking? Whether we're talking about your professional life or your personal life, the things you do for work or the things you do for fun, sometimes it's good to periodically remind yourself how you became that person, how you got here, and why. What inspired you towards those choices in your life? inspired you towards those actions. Rediscovering your first love is a good way of getting there. And the same thing goes for us spiritually. You are a Christian, and it is the most important thing about your identity. It's who you are. And if you've been doing this for a long time, like most of us have been, eventually you will be tempted to forget how you got here and why you're here. You're tempted to become stale in the faith. You're tempted to take the promises of the gospel for granted, even to treat the threats of the law lightly. You're tempted to forget your first love for the Lord. That, it seems, is what was happening in Ephesus. And if that's happening to you today, you've come to the right place. Because today we remember how and why we got here. In the words of our theme, rediscover your first love for the Lord. See his loving presence, hear his loving words, and work his love in all that you do. So when John first hears this voice of the exalted and glorified Jesus, he turns around and the first thing he sees is these seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. It's very similar wording and imagery that we see also in Daniel chapter 7, this vision of the son of man appearing like this. And then Jesus reveals the mystery of these seven lampstands. He says, these seven lampstands are the seven churches. Think about the implications of that. Jesus walks among the lampstands. Jesus walks among his churches. It really shouldn't be a surprise to find that Christ is present here with his people. After all, he promised, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. And so here today at the lampstand of Mount Zion Lutheran Church, he's here. His presence is here. He is among us right now. He also promised us, I'm with you always, to the end of the age. So we have these simple comforting promises. Such simple promises to hear. Such simple promises to forget as well. Just take this current coronavirus pandemic, for example. How many times throughout the day do you find yourself opening your phone again, scrolling to get the latest updates, stay up to task on what's going on? How often do you find yourself reaching for that TV remote to hear the latest expert talk about what he thinks is going on and the danger involved? How often have you reached for your Bible to find those kinds of answers? How often have you reached up your hands in prayer, going to God with your concerns and your questions? Remember that your almighty Savior, who's face, we're told, shines like the sun in full strength, is reminding you, just like you remind John, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. Jesus was there at the very beginning, he's going to be there at the very end, and he's going to be with us all along the way. 
And so his loving presence means that we have nothing to fear. We do have much to prayerfully and humbly think about and how we're going to conduct ourselves now. But we have nothing to worry about. Not ever. He's here with us right now. He's in the midst of his churches, walking among the lampstands. And he will not abandon us. And sometimes in our sinful weakness, we might feel panic and forget his promises about protection and peace, but he never ever forgets us. And he never ever hesitates from giving us those promises anyway. Not only is he here for us, but he also has his loving words for us, right? Just like in Ephesus. He told John, you know, write these things down. What I'm about to show you, write it down. One of my seminary professors was, was fond of reminding us to imagine how short God could have made the Bible and still saved us. It's a good thing to think about, you know. He didn't have to give us all five books of Moses. He didn't have to give us the Psalms or the Proverbs or all 12 of the minor prophets. He didn't have to give us all four Gospels. And he didn't have to have John write down this revelation from Jesus. But he did. Why did he give us all that? So much more than we, we need. Love. Love is why. More and more promises. More and more of God's love showing through in his word. The Bible says God is love. And the Bible is all about God's love, isn't it? By faith, we understand that even God's law is love. Right? In love, God reveals his wrath to us by revealing his anger against sin through the teaching of his law. So even God's law is an act of his love. He shows us the blunder of our sinful ways and the sin, the punishment that those sins deserve, that eternity in hell, suffering forever. That's love. It's love because it tells us that our deep depravity, our need. And, of course, the gospel. Where's the love in the gospel? That's easy, isn't it? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if you're a Christian looking to rediscover your first love, our first love is it's God's love. God's love for us in Christ. And so we need to go back to the beginning. Those simple things, the simple promises, God's loving law and God's loving gospel. You know, that's about as simple as it gets and that's as good as it gets too. We deserve sadness and hopelessness and fear about death and what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen after we die. That's what we deserve. And instead, we receive joy and happiness, fearlessness, confidence that heaven is our home because of who Jesus is and what he's done. The Ephesians, of course, were doing all the correct outward works, so it seems, weren't they? Jesus even tells them, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. It seems like they were remaining faithful to the truth. They weren't growing weary. They were even stamping out false teaching, as some people came in to claim to be apostles, and they weren't. This other group called the Nicolaitans, a bunch of fake Christians, they were coming in and trying to lead people away, and they stamped them out as well. But, Jesus says, he has one thing against them. They'd abandoned this first love. They were doing the right works but without the right motivation. And so he says, repent or your lampstand will be removed. It's kind of a chilling threat of the law there, isn't it? Repent or your lampstand will be removed. It's a good reminder to us as well. You know, if you are a Christian who's recently come to faith, and we have some people like that here at our church, you can probably still vividly remember that first delight over your first love for the Lord. It's overwhelming. You see that with new Christians. If you ever have the, the blessing of meeting someone who's just coming to faith in God, God witnesses to their spirit that their sins are paid for, that heaven is theirs, they're a child of God, and it affects the way they act immediately. You can see it. it. brings them great joy and freedom and excitement. But for the rest of us, we Christians who have been carrying our cross for much of our lives, 
probably have to look back quite a bit further to find that first love for the Lord. You're no doubt tempted to go through the motions of the Christian life, work the works of the child of God, without remembering the reason why, without remembering the love behind those works. It's great if we can endure hardship, but it means nothing without love. It's great if we can stamp out false teaching, but that means nothing without love either. And if you've been a Christian your whole life and you're looking to rediscover that first love for the Lord, then you need to go back to the beginning. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Remember that? Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Remember your childhood love for the Lord? You remember the joy of first learning that you are Jesus' little lamb? Ever glad at heart? That he gently guides you, that he knows your name and still provides for you? As you grow up and become an older sheep, maybe you start to get a little bold in your ways. You think your own experience and your own reason can guide you. You forget. You are Jesus' little lamb. You remember the simple of excitement, of first learning that Jesus loves you, for the Bible tells you so? Not any other reason, because the Bible tells you so. That's that simple childlike faith. That's that love for the Lord. You remember the happiness that you found at first learning that Jesus' tomb was empty on Easter morning? Empty tomb. Yes, those are the countless simple acts that are at the root of of our love for God, our first love for the Lord. All these things our Savior did and does for us, that's where we rediscover that first love. Jesus himself even reminded this to John in our text for today. He said right away, I died, and behold, I live forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. On Maundy Thursday, Jesus told his disciples to love one another as he loved them, and that there's no greater love than that someone should lay down his life for his friend. And it is this love that moved God to send his own son for the life of the world. And this is the first love, the original love, God's love in Christ. That is the genesis of all other types of love and all of love's works too. In the Gospels, you know, we're used to seeing Jesus in his humiliation. So when we read this, this vision of Jesus to John, it's kind of shocking to see him in all his power and glory, isn't it? Uh, he's fully exalted and glorified here. You know, we were just reading in the Passion history uh, about the religious leaders, and what were they doing to him? Beating him, mocking him, even spitting on him. It's hard to imagine them spitting on a guy in John's vision, isn't it? But that's exactly what was happening. How could someone as powerful and as glorious as the Son of Man in that vision, how could he die? It seems preposterous, but that's exactly what happened. He laid down his life for his friends, for you and for me. He made you his first love, didn't he? And then he took his life up again, because he has the power to do so. And behold, he is alive forever, and he has the keys to death and Hades. Not the coronavirus, not Satan, not anybody else. Jesus has the keys to death and Hades. It means he has all power over them. He has all power over everything in this world, and he gives us the power of eternal life. So how did you get here? Why are you a Christian? Why are you visiting this lampstand today? Well, it's because despite having every reason not to, your almighty, all-glorious God loved you, and he gave himself for you. That's how and that's why. And because of that, you're going to be a conqueror one day. Jesus says to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So heaven is yours. And so we do work those works of the Ephesians, aren't we? We're on guard. We don't grow weary. We don't give in to panic and fear like so many other people do. We endure. We stamp out false teaching. We do it for the sake of the love of your God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. We read in 2 Corinthians, kind of a closing verse here. 
The love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Raised forevermore. 